Hi Get Real family, I'm so excited for today's special guest on Get Real Talk, none other than John Lennox. He needs no introduction. He is Emeritus Professor of Mathematics at Oxford University and he has written many books about science and faith in particular. He wrote a great short book about um, the coronavirus, where is God in a coronavirus world? And I was taught by him whilst I did my training in apologetics. I'm absolutely just thrilled that I had the opportunity to talk to him for Science Week, uh, where we're going to be discussing um, the seeming conflict between science and faith. Do check it out. Welcome to you, John. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's really good to see you again. <laughs> no worries, no worries. So John and I, we did um, uh, a kind of session with um, online with Justin Briley, looking at questions uh, questions that young people may ask um, related to the coronavirus, this is back in 2020, but it was a great time and um, I'm so glad that John has joined us for Science Week, no, no less. We'll be unpacking some questions today about the supposed conflict between science and faith. So John, can you begin by telling us um, what's it like being um, a Christian in academia, particularly in the sciences. Fascinating. <laughs> I've had a very interesting life because I, I feel that being a Christian and a scientist is really true to the spirit of the origins of modern science, where the pioneers, starting with Galileo and coming up through Johannes Kepler, Isaac Newton, and so on, were all believers in God. And there's a, there's a very strong affinity, although, of course, the popular myth is that there is a conflict between God and science. So I've enjoyed it immensely, not only because I feel that by doing science, I'm doing something that's perfectly consistent and indeed inspired by my faith in God, but it's given me a real opportunity to debate with and discuss with people who hold different worldviews, particularly Mm. Um, atheist people. And I think that's been a very important thing in which to be involved because I, I do feel that there's a real danger these days of what is called scientism, which we may come to later. No, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Because I remember um, reading uh, your shorter book, Can Science Explain Everything? And you describe some of your um, background uh, working um, in the sciences and, and um, being a, a professing Christian and, and just being able to engage with your colleagues who may not believe the same things as you in that, just and engaging in such a winsome way as well. So you mentioned this, this, this myth of the conflict between science and faith. So where does it actually come from in your, in your, in your mind? Well, first of all, there's no conflict between science and faith, depending how you define faith. I think well, we need to step back a bit because I think you're using the word faith as a shorthand for religion. And that creates a huge confusion in people's minds because mm -hmm. faith has two very distinct meanings. It can be used as shorthand for religion, like the Muslim faith, the Christian faith, the Jewish faith, and, and so on. But it also has a subjective meaning, my personal belief, my personal faith. And science is absolutely involved in faith. Every scientist, for example, as Einstein, no less, pointed out, has to believe before they start doing science that the universe is rationally intelligible. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to get away from any conflict between science and faith. The conflict in some people's minds lies between science and faith in God. Okay. So I, I would want to speak about faith in science, uh, where it is everywhere, and faith in God. And uh, to my way of thinking, both are evidence-based. And so where does it come from? That's a very complex question. It comes partly uh, for real historical reasons coming out of the Enlightenment and the reaction against a corrupt church and all this kind of mm -hmm. thing. It comes partly from the way in which science developed Isaac Newton's mechanistic universe seemed to leave very little space for God. 
and uh, many people thought God was first unnecessary, then irrelevant, uh, and then he might as well not exist to the point where they said, well, he doesn't exist. But the fact that there's no essential conflict between uh, science and believing in God is evident to me. It's so easy to see you know, when only you think about it. Uh, the easy example is the Nobel Prize for Physics. Peter Higgs, the Scotsman, won it a few years ago for the prediction of the Higgs boson. And a few years before that, Bill Phillips won the very same prize. So they're both brilliant scientists. They're mm -hmm. not divided by their science. They are divided, though, by their worldview. Okay. Uh, Phillips is a believer in God, and uh, Higgs uh, is an atheist. So I think it's enough to quote those two to show that there can be no essential conflict between science and faith in God. There's certainly, if that were the case, there would be no Nobel Prize winning physicists who believed in God. And people often are totally unaware of the fact that in the century between 1900 and 2000, over 60% of all Nobel Prize winning scientists believed in God. So there's a myth out there and it, mm. it needs to be uh, contradicted. Of course, there are other more subtle reasons and they have to do with understanding what science is and what it does and all this kind of thing. One of the things you said there, John, about um, there not being a conflict between science and faith and actually having that challenged, the recent, um, 20, I think it's 2018 Religion and Worldviews Commission, it was a report that was done, is actually saying to, to teachers of RE that all worldviews need to be questioned or, you know, students need to be guided into examining the claims of all worldviews, whether that's Christianity, Islam, or atheism. And actually, when you ask those fundamental questions of life and meaning and purpose, and also our ability to reason, what are we going to come up with? I think it's going to be a very good shift, actually, changing uh, RE from religious education to religion and worldview. So we're actually looking now at the claims of worldviews rather than um, this myth, kind of, which we see in, in uh, the belief that there is a conflict well, between science you, and faith. You've hit the precise point. There is a conflict. It's not between science and God. It's between worldviews. And in particular, in the case I mentioned, uh, it's the conflict between atheism and theism. And, and there are scientists on both sides. And that's the only way to look at this whole discussion sensibly. So the real question is, which worldview sits best with science? And I conclude, spending a lifetime on it, really, that Christianity fits best with science and atheism doesn't really fit at all. Thank you. Yep, yeah, and I'm sure we'll be unpacking some of that uh, um, as we move on. And do, honestly, you need to get hold of the many books that John has written. I've been listening to a few of them in my car and reading some of them as well. Absolutely just brilliant, prolific author looking at and examining this very question, this very seeming conflict between science and faith. So, John, can you tell us, is there any evidence um, from the sciences for faith in God? A lot of people will say things like, I don't believe in God, I, I don't trust God, I believe, I follow the science or I believe the science. But is there evidence in the sciences for the existence of God? Well, of course there is. There's evidence at the most fundamental level, the very fact that we can do science C.S. Lewis once summed up the work of the famous philosopher and historian of science, Sir Alfred North Whitehead, and he said that men became scientific because they expected law and nature, and they expected law and nature because they believed in a, a lawgiver. In other words, faith in God, far from hindering science, was the motor that drove it. And, and that's the position I take. And if you unpack that, uh, why was that the case? Well, what happened was that the biblical worldview, the theistic worldview, gave a rational universe and an intelligent creator behind it who created humans in his image. And therefore, the doing of science, understanding the world using our human rationality, was really thinking God's thoughts after him. So uh, they fit perfectly well together. So the very fact that we can do science seems to me to point towards 
God. Because if you take the opposite view of atheism, then I don't see that there's any rational justification for doing science for another very simple reason, that the atheist explanation tells me that my mind, although many atheists don't believe in the mind, they um, <laughs> believe simply in the human <laughs> brain as a machine, uh, they tell me that my brain is the end result of a mindless, unguided process, and yet they trust it. And it seems, therefore, to me very clear that atheism provides absolutely no justification whatsoever, not only for doing science, but for thinking at all. And C.S. Lewis once <laughs> pointed out very clearly that any theory that undermines human rationality uh, is self-contradictory. It's an oxymoron because you reach it by thinking. And my position is I'd much rather prefer and hold to a worldview that validates my rationality in doing science and everything else than to hold to a worldview that invalidates rationality. And that's where I believe the atheist worldview sits. Thank you so much. You kind of um, preempted a, a quote that I loved from your book, uh, 2084, uh, where you say, how could I espouse a worldview that arguably abolishes the very rationality I need to do mathematics? By contrast, the biblical worldview that traces the origin of human rationality to the fact that we're created in the image of a rational God makes real sense as an explanation of why we can do science. And I think that is something that young people especially need to be guided into questioning what is the logical conclusion of a universe without God? Where, where do we land? And I think the things that you're raising there about rationality, our ability to reason, to do science in the first place is really, really helpful. Um, so you mentioned scientism before, John. What is the difference between science and scientism, please? Scientism is the view that science can tell us everything. And it arose historically, we started with the natural sciences. And there's a, a view due to Auguste Comte called positivism, which essentially said, if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. And the natural sciences were the source of measurement. So moving beyond the natural sciences, people felt that they could apply this kind of measurement ideology uh, to all areas of human life, particularly in sociology and uh, human behavior. And so it came about that you, you found many more disciplines being called sciences. So we have social science and political science and all this kind of thing. And in the end, uh, people came to think that therefore science can deal with everything. But what has not been noticed is that the definition of science has changed. And some people, it seems to me, confuse science with rationality. And of course, if, if you're going to say rationality can explain everything, that's a tautology, because explanation is, of course, by definition, one would hope, rational. So that is one of the sources. The other source is the very powerful uh, rhetoric of people like Richard Dawkins and so on, and, and uh, the late Stephen Hawking, who were very much in a scientific framework. And I would want to just cut through all this and, and point out that scientism, the idea that science, the natural sciences can explain everything is, is clearly false because the statement that science explains everything is not a statement of science, it's a statement about science. So if science can explain everything, it cannot explain itself. And, uh, that kind of fairly obvious piece of elementary logic led people like Sir Peter Medawar, who won the Nobel Prize for his scientific work, to say that it's so obvious that science, the natural sciences, are, are limited because they cannot answer the simple questions of a child. Where do I come from? Where am I going? What is the meaning of my life? And to, to make that more precise, 
the natural sciences tend to deal with the lesser important things in life, particularly the question of meaning and the question of ethics. And we need to go way beyond the natural sciences. And after all, if scientism was true, half the faculties in our universities around the world would have to close. There'd be no literature, there'd be no history, and so on. And that's simply absurd. Yeah, your point about um, the university sort of faculties, it's actually quite a powerful thing to say to young people. So I've been doing some um, university, uh, Christian Union events weeks and, and talking to the young people saying, look, if, 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 if scientism is true, then let's just, half, half the people in the room should go home because this isn't, you know, University I don't know, of Sussex, the Science University of Sussex. It's the University of Sussex and there's lots of ways of knowing and acquiring meaning and purpose and, um, and knowledge about the world. And so I think the idea of scientism, as you so clearly explained, it reduces human existence it's a very narrow view of life. And when I think about Jesus answering the question, um, what's the greatest commandment? He said to love the Lord of all, uh, Lord your God of all your heart, soul, mind and, and strength. So we're holistic beings. We're not just um, atoms and molecules. I think, yeah, I love um, just hearing you talk about the difference between science and scientism. And actually people might say that they, they don't trust God, they trust science or they, they don't believe in God, they believe in science, but they don't live that way. They don't live in a way that only... Well, of course they don't live that way. And, and often the basic question is they have been bamboozled by something else that is the subtext, it's an elephant in the room. And it's the word faith. They've been taught that faith is a religious word mm -hmm. that means believing without evidence. And that's the confusion I referred to at the beginning. We should never actually talk about God and, uh, sorry, science and faith. We should talk about science and God. And the new atheist Dawkins type definition leads to absolutely absurd statements by him and the late Christopher Hitchens and many others where they say scientists have no faith. And they will say that in a book which describes in great detail what they believe, what their faith <laughs> is. So they're totally confused by saying that faith is a religious word, which means believing where there's no evidence. That's blind faith. The Oxford English Dictionary points out that faith comes from the word fides, and any sensible concept, everyday concept of faith, the next question to ask is what, the, what is the evidence on which your belief is based? If I want to mortgage and go to a bank manager, and want him to have faith in me, I, I will have to bring up evidence of the collateral I have, otherwise I won't get it. And all of us know, mm -hmm. actually, what evidence-based faith is. Anything less is, of course, uh, can be very dangerous. Okay, so John, you talked about um, definitions of faith um, being, when applied to sort of Christianity, this idea of blind faith and, you know, that's not what we're talking about when we talk about God or, or trusting God based on the evidence of what he's shown us about himself in the world, in the very creation. Um, but what do we do when people say, look, at the centre of Christianity is this idea that Jesus rose from the dead. Um, you know, surely we, we can't take that seriously. And that's just a, that's a, that's a step too far. Well, they say that often because they've never heard a sensible argument for it. Uh, the idea that it's a step too far, even if you uh, go back to science, uh, quantum mechanics for many people would be a step too far. But people believe quantum mechanics because it fits the evidence. And sadly, reaction against the resurrection of Jesus often comes in the name of science. And uh, the argument is that we now know the laws of nature and a resurrection would violate the laws of nature. So as a rational person, I cannot possibly believe in the resurrection. But that is a complete failure to think through exactly what's going on. David Hume, who was the author of that argument, got it wrong, actually. Mm. And it's relatively easy to see, as C.S. Lewis pointed out, that 
The idea of violating the laws of nature is a confusion between the laws of nature and the laws of a country. And he illustrated it brilliantly, to my mind, by uh, imagining someone staying in a hotel. And suppose I'm staying in a hotel and I put £100 in the drawer on the first night, another 100 on the second night. So arithmetic, the laws of arithmetic will tell me I've got £200 in the drawer. But I wake up on the third morning and I find £50 in the drawer. I would never think of reacting and saying the laws of arithmetic have been broken. I might say that the laws of England had been broken, but I know that the laws of England have been broken because the laws of arithmetic have not been broken. You see, mm. the laws of arithmetic describe what normally happens when you add one and one. They cannot prevent a thief putting his or her hand into the drawer and stating 150 quid. And that's a very simple illustration, but it, it actually helps us understand what the situation is. The fact that we recognize the resurrection of Jesus as a miracle, as something supernatural. Now, miracle is a word with all kinds of meanings. We can say of a lady called Jane, it was a miracle she passed her exams. I'm not talking about that kind of thing. <laughs> We're talking about a supernatural dimension. And that means it's not something that's normally happening within the general everyday running of the universe. But you see, you can only recognize something supernatural if you know what the natural is. And what we're faced with is the fact that God has, I believe, created a universe which is built to run on certain regularities which we call the laws of nature, and scientists have discovered them. And so Newton discovered that if you drop an apple, it will fall towards the center of the earth. But Newton's law doesn't stop someone catching the apple before it hits the earth. And similarly, at the bigger level, God, the creator, is not bound in some legal sense by the laws of nature, he can feed a new event into the system. Now, if you go back to my drawer in my hotel room, what was my mistake? My mistake was thinking that the drawer and the room indeed was a closed system of cause and effect. But it isn't. It's an open system into which a thief could put their hand. And that's exactly where we are with the universe. Uh, materialists, naturalists, think that the universe is a closed system of cause and effect. That is their fundamental, unproven belief. And of course, if that is the case, then there is no supernatural. But you see, there's no in principle intellectual objection to God feeding a new event into the universe, like raising Jesus from the dead by his power. There's no objection from a philosophical point of view. So what we have next to do is to say, is there any evidence historically and in experience that Jesus rose from the dead? Science cannot tell you that. Of course not. We, weren't, <clears throat> we cannot repeat it like an experiment to see if it happened. But we do have evidence of two kinds. We have the historical evidence contained in the New Testament, and we can test that because Christianity has left its mark, not only in literature, but in history. But secondly, we can test the claims of Christ. If he rose from the dead, he's still alive. And he claims that if we um, face certain things about our lives, the mess we've made perhaps of them and of other peoples and repent and trust him, then he will do certain things, give us peace. And that's a very real thing, that we'll know forgiveness, that we'll have a new power to live. Now, I've tested that in my own life, and I've seen it happen in hundreds of other people's lives. And all of that adds up. So it's nonsense to suggest that science or rational thought can disprove the possibility of resurrection. And once we see that it is possible in the theoretical sense, we then investigate it from the historical and experiential senses. And they come up with very strong and powerful evidence that Jesus actually rose from the dead. And the very existence of the Christian church 
and the Christian message is one of the proofs of that. Thank you so much, John. I love the way that um, you kind of build this cumulative case for the resurrection and also for 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 belief in God that, you know, you can, it's um, the resurrection is not only possible because we know that philosophically, then the personal experiences and also the historical um, accounts from, from the gospels. And I think sometimes when talking to people who object to Christianity on the basis of believing that um, science has canceled God, they haven't thought, they, they, all they want is this mic drop response. Give me the one equation that will prove God exists and then I'll believe. And actually, if God is the creator, and you talk about this in many of your books, if God is the creator and he um, is above creation itself, then we would see traces of who he is in creation. We'd see that in the way that we can think, in the way that we can reason, um, and, and, and many other ways as well. So, And also what I love as well is that you don't discount personal experience. Because I think, I, you know, I grew up in a Christian home, and um, a lot of people will say to me, oh, you're only a Christian because your parents were. But actually, no, that's just not the case. And are you only an atheist because you were brought up in a non-Christian home too? So that argument also cuts both ways. Oh, I wish I could keep you on here forever. But I'm going to land with one question that's kind of split up into two, please, John. And the first part of it is what advice would you give to, first of all, seekers and skeptics who reject Christianity because of the seeming conflict between science and faith? So what advice would you give to them? Well, I'm a skeptic. The Greek word skeptine, from which the word skeptic comes, means to check out from a distance. So I would encourage people to check things out from, from a distance. And we've been talking about two sorts of things today. First of all, there's checking out intellectually and from a rational perspective. But because God is not a theory, he's a person, to, there comes a point where if you want to get to know a person, you've got to give up your distance. Now, most of us, when it comes to friendship, are careful about giving up our distance, and rightly so. We're skeptical. We don't just trust everyone because we know we live in a world where there are bad people and violent people and abusive people. So we need to check things out. But there comes a point where the evidence is powerful enough uh, from the skeptic's point of view, where we can risk, if I might put it that way, giving up our distance and come to trust a person. And that is very much true uh, when it comes to Christ. And uh, what I would say to skeptics is, well, I've written a number of books. And if you want to look at my little book, Can Science Explain Everything?, it it covers all this kind of thing. And if you're interested in seeing things, well, I've done a documentary film recently based both in Oxford and in Israel, which discusses both aspects of this to, to give a, a kind of rounded picture. And you can get that on streaming. It's, it's a film that I did with a Hollywood actor, Kevin Sorbo, who's pretty well known from his Hercules and Andromeda days, and it's called the Against the Tide. But sure, keep asking your questions and begin to, I would say, begin to, if you've never done that as an adult, open a New Testament and ask your questions. Start maybe with the Gospel of John and ask your questions. Jesus' first followers were highly skeptical of many of the things he claimed, and it took them a while uh, to come to grips with the fact that he was true. And so I believe that if you opened your mind to the possibility that Jesus is God incarnate and he's come to save us in all kinds of, uh, of senses, then he will give you evidence that fits you. If you make up your mind in advance that atheism is true, of course, you'll never rise above that. But I would just point out to you that you're shutting yourself in your own prison. <laughs> Thank you so much, John. I like the way that you say that, you know, basically skepticism isn't isn't bad. Um, it's actually quite a good thing to to be skeptical about anyone's claims to be the truth. You know, Jesus says that in St. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth and the life. Well, if you're saying that, let's test it. Let's actually interrogate those claims. OK, and this question, I think, is a big one for me because um growing up in my background. What advice then would you give to Christians who are nervous about taking science seriously? And I've kind of seen, you know, 
if you don't take literal um, literal six uh, uh, if you don't take six day creation literally then that's the litmus test for whether you're a real christian or not and whether you have this blind faith in god which actually is a better version of faith um so i've seen those sorts of things kind of bubbling around in christian circles but what would you say to christians who are nervous about taking science well if they're nervous about taking science seriously because of some alleged clash with christianity and science then they need to face where that clash occurs and because the particular thing you mentioned the clash that people feel there is between the narrative description of creation in early genesis and scientific findings then you need to know something but i find that a lot of people have not taken either the science seriously nor the biblical side seriously and i'm afraid <laughs> i'm about to advertise another book which i've just republished there's a second edition of my book, Seven Days That Divide the World. So somebody who's concerned about that, my own conclusion, but I can't argue for it now because it would take too long, is that there's, there's nothing in scripture actually that fixes uh, the, the, the date uh, of when creation occurred. And that might surprise some people, but it's to do with the biblical text actually. But I'll have to leave that either for another time or for people that want to know to look at my book. Now, here's another point. If people bring up that kind of objection, I say, what have you read about it? Mm. And people often say nothing. Well, I say, look, if you are a student or a thinking person, that, that won't do. Surely that won't do. You need to read some stuff and, and find out what people have said about these things. And I've spent my life being a skeptic on behalf of many people and writing about these things. But it, it just won't do to say, oh, well, uh, I'm nervous of science because of Genesis 1, but they, and they haven't read anything about it. That's why they're nervous. Often people are nervous through sheer ignorance of what the true situation is. A similar thing is the people that go along with the late Christopher Hitchens and wonder whether Jesus really existed or not. And they've never read any ancient historians, the vast majority of which yeah. believe not only that Jesus existed, but many, if not most of the things that are said about him in the New Testament are true. We need to inform ourselves and I don't mind people being skeptical, but I, I do find it difficult when people aren't prepared to consider evidence while at the same time demanding it. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. And I think that's for both camps, whether you're a seeker, whether you have questions about Christianity, or whether you are a Christian as well. Both sides need to be reading more, need to be listening to and investigating the landscape of ideas and then making a decision. Um, so you already mentioned quite a few books there and I have actually read Seven Days That Divide the World. I'm going to have to get the second edition now. And as I said, I've been listening to um, The Dulcet Tones of Justin Briley, actually, your aud the audiobook version of 2084. Absolutely loving it. Um, but how can we follow your work, John? And are you working on any more projects, please? Well, I'm constantly working and I, I think the best way and thank you for your interest is to look at my website, johnlennox.org, where things are coming on. Um, 2084 has created a lot of interest, artificial intelligence, and I'm constantly revising that and thinking about it. So in a few years time, uh, I'll probably bring out a much larger <laughs> Mm -hmm. edition of that book because it has stimulated such a lot of response. I, I do think we need to be thinking about the implication of the technology that's rapidly uh, becoming central to our world in both positive and negative ways. Mm -hmm. So I, I definitely recommend that book. Thank you for so much, John. Especially, I, I'm not a scientist, but actually I uh, my background is in um, English literature and, and humanities and switching to social sciences now but um just to say that john draws on a lot of sources to to, to argue his points and i really love the way that he used um, you know brave new world in 1984 and these other literary texts and yuval harari's work there to 
to kind of explain, you know, for for the, for the layperson, uh, what you're what you're actually saying. So I really really enjoy um, listening to your book. Thank you so much, John. Thank you everyone else for tuning in. I hope this has been a great addition to your Science Week, and stay tuned for more um, content coming from Get Real. Thank you so much, John. That's my pleasure, and I think I like your title, Get Real. We are passionate about reality. And by the way, it's, it's lovely to talk to someone who's in the humanities. I'm as passionate about the humanities and literature as I am about the natural sciences because the natural sciences don't tell us really all that much except in very narrow and important fields. And if we're looking for meaning, we will have to go to literature. And of course, one of the most important pieces of literature for me is the Bible. But thank you very much, Claire. Lovely to see you again. Goodbye. Thank you, John. Take care, everyone.